The fur trading business has never been confined to the Great Lakes alone. But the forests and inland lakes of this area have produced so many valuable mammals, it's remained the most important source of furs in the nation. As early as 1840, the U.S. Census Bureau placed the value of Great Lakes furs at a half a million dollars annually. At the eastern end of the Upper Lakes, Mackinac Island, now a part of Michigan, served for decades as the center of trade operations that extended southward on Lake Michigan, westward to the end of Lake Superior, down the Mississippi to include much of Minnesota and Wisconsin. For 200 years, fur trading was the only commerce in Wisconsin. During French rule, Green Bay was the major trading center. The first important contact with the Indians along Lakes Michigan and Superior were not by the fur traders, but by missionaries. Jesuit records tell of the visit of Radisson and Grossier in 1654, who encountered hostile Chippewas in the vicinity of Ashland, Wisconsin, but friendly members of the very same tribe on Minnesota's north shore. The first building put up by the white men on Lake Superior was the hut erected by these two missionaries. It may have looked something like this, though probably less well made. It was put up on Shawamigan Bay near Ashland. As the French pressed westward, partly in the hope of finding a route to the Pacific Ocean, the community of Grand Portage, now in extreme northeastern Minnesota, was established. It began with a crude post built by Graceland Sir Duluth in the year 1679. The Northwest Company was formed here, and a huge stockade with a great hall and numerous wooden buildings constructed in the 18th century. For well over a century, it was the single most important center of commerce and fur trading. The Great Hall burned after being rebuilt and turned into a National Historic Site in 1951, but has since been restored and is again open to the public. And every effort has been made to keep the building features as close as possible to the original one. By the start of the 18th century, the Indians who had inhabited the lands around the Great Lakes for so many centuries began to experience the problems that would grow in seriousness as they dealt with the white men. At first, the traders wanted only their furs that came from their lands, and later, the white men wanted the lands itself that supported the Indians and the wildlife. The beaver quickly became the mainstay of the fur industry, caught and stretched round into what are still known as blankets. For the Indians, the beaver blankets served as money. With 25 skins, they could buy one gun, for each additional hide, they would get a pound of shot, but they would have to pay a dozen beaver skins for one European cloth blanket. The tomahawk and other tools or weapons of war had always been fashioned of stone or in rare cases of raw copper. Often the workmanship was a work of art with beauty not seen in the European goods. But the metal axe of Europe was far more durable and though lacking in beauty and fine artistry, it was more practical, and the Indians paid four skins for each one bought. Cases of axe heads were brought from England and hauled from lake to portage to lake, from Lachine near Quebec to Kingston to Niagara, overland to Lake Erie, and then in larger vessels to Mackinac. Goods assigned to Lake Superior were transferred at Sault Ste. Marie. Items shipped to traders on the Mississippi and its tributaries went via the Fox and Wisconsin rivers. This was the territory of the Mackinac Company, started by the British merchants on Mackinac Island. While on the one hand, the traders were selling guns, powder, and lead for bullets to the Indians, they were at the same time building stockades and forts to stave off attacks from the very people to whom they were selling the weapons. Though the exact design is unknown, this is what the early French fort on Lake Pepin, a wide part of the upper Mississippi, is thought to have looked like. Built in 1726, it was called Fort Bernois. The French later burned it after repeated Indian attacks and then fled, but it was later rebuilt. 
It's presumed the fort also had a church, and this would have been the first in Minnesota. Like so many of the close to 200 posts and forts built in Minnesota alone, the records have been lost. The posts usually had guard stations at opposite ends of the stockade. The occupants as much concerned about the danger of fire as they were Indian attacks. Post operators, clerks, and other employees and visiting traders stayed within the stockade. While on the move between the posts, the boatmen who worked for the traders must have lived a mixture of pleasure and hardships, required to stay on duty at all hours, and guard the property, or else give up part of their meager wages of $83.33 a year if something had been stolen. And if the men were careless and left behind some valued articles, the trader usually refused to return for them and simply deducted their value from the wages of the whole crew. The cowhide shoes that protected their feet on the rocky portages around rapids, like this one along the St. Louis River on the Savannah Portage in northeastern Minnesota, were provided by the trader. He also outfitted his men with two cotton shirts, a triangular blanket, and a tump line worn across the forehead when carrying heavy loads. Only on the best traveled routes near settlements or posts did they find ditches and swamps with log walkways. More likely, they waded waist deep in mud or muskeg, bitten by mosquitoes and black flies. Generally acknowledged as the worst was the Savannah Portage that was used to go from the Mississippi to Lake Superior. This was a part of the territory of John Jacob Astor, who started the first major American fur operation when he founded the American Fur Company in 1809. One of his posts was this one at Fond du Lac in Duluth. One of the men who struggled over this portage said in his diary that the going was so difficult, the trousers of the men were ripped to shreds and their legs red and bleeding from the sharp sticks in the muskeg, and tempers were very short. Those involved in the inland trade used mostly the north canoe for long distances and heavy loads, and the small Indian canoe for short trips. The Montreal canoe was confined to the Great Lakes. Sail-driven boats came later. Some of the portages used remain to this day the ground kept bare by modern-day hikers who never knew the agony of bearing up under the weight of two 90-pound packs as the men hauled everything from bells to beads, garters and guns, jewelry and juice harps, whiskey and wine, and anything else that the Native Americans could possibly want for their furs. The portages were measured in poses or stops, places where the men rested after toting their loads about a third of a mile between stops. One portage in Wisconsin at Lac du Flambeau was an incredible 45 miles with 122 poses. By contrast, some other portages were so short there were no rest stops. When possible, wild game was shot for food. Anything a welcome change from the day after day diet of hulled corn made into a soup. Rarely was the whole bear, deer, moose, or buffalo eaten. Fresh meat was not carried along, though bear grease was kept to be mixed with the corn to make pemmican. There was a great deal of waste. Alexander Henry the Younger, one of the founders of the Northwest Company, tells of killing two buffalo for four men. They ate only the tongues and a fatty part of the belly, then continued on their journey, and two days later, they were completely without food and weak from hunger. Raccoon pelts were the most sought after fur in the first half of the 19th century. Experts claim the best quality came from the Great Lakes, even though the animal was found in many other parts of the U.S. Four million raccoon pelts were shipped overseas in the 1840s, most of them to Great Britain. 300,000 mink were also sold at $4 apiece. And even skunk pelts were high on the list of the most desired furs. In the late 1880s, 300,000 were caught and skinned and sent to England for the price of a dollar each. <laughs>
Muskrats, which are now worth far more than the skunks, were the most numerous animals caught, almost a million a year, but then they sold for only nine cents apiece. The skins were brought to the trading posts in raw condition. Indian women were hired to scrape off the excess fat and flesh, and the skins were dried. Just about all mammals, ranging from weasels to grizzly bears, were trapped and sometimes even swan skins were sold. In the posts, the furs were put into a press and formed into bundles weighing 90 pounds each. The wooden presses were crude, but they did the job surprisingly well. This scale found at the fur post at Fond du Lac was typical of those used to weigh the bales, and it was surprisingly accurate. One of the American Fur Company seals was also found on the site of the old post. It was fixed on the bales to make sure the merchant got his full bale. Each company had its own emblem or brand, usually with a motto. Connor's fur post was typical of the smaller and temporary structures built by the traders at the beginning of the 19th century. This one was on the Snake River near the Minnesota-Wisconsin border at Pine City. Thomas Connors was employed by the Northwest Company, and his post flew the British flag. He and his men and some Chippewas built the 77-foot-long six-room cabin and stockade in six weeks, starting in early October of 1804. The Minnesota Historical Society finished reconstruction in 1970 after six summers of work. The post is open to the public during the summer months. Though it seems to be a terrible waste today, the post was abandoned after a single season of use. Connors, his Chippewa wife, and his men left it on April 27th of 1805 with their furs, wild rice, and maple sugar taken in as trade from the Indians, and they then traveled down the Great Lakes. At most trading posts, a number of Indians would erect their teepees very close to the white man's forts. And if a warring tribe attacked, they would seek refuge in the stockade. In the later years of fur trading, unlicensed white men penetrated Indian territory and frequently took up the lifestyle of the people they lived with and very often chose one of the women as a wife. And from the Indians, they learned to make snowshoes, dog sleds, how to gather maple sap and make syrup and candy. And in general, borrowing anything they could from them that would make their life easier and safer. Except for personal needs, the Indians used very few furs. They thought the white man was strange for trading goods for them. Because the Indians wore off the unwanted outer or long guard hairs in daily use, the furs were literally bought off the backs of these aboriginal people. The business of fur trading left deep and long-lasting effects on the animal life of today. Some species were wiped out and have never returned. Others, like the pine marten, are endangered. The timber wolf, killed for its hide, for bounty, or out of foolish fears, is now able to survive in numbers only in Minnesota and on Isle Royal. A few, perhaps, are in the wilds of Upper Michigan and Northern Wisconsin. But little wonder their kind have almost disappeared. In one season, for example, the Northwest Company killed 690 at eight of their posts. The lakes and the rivers no longer serve as highways for the traders, the boatmen, and the Indians. The birch bark canoes have been replaced by those of aluminum. And many of the wrongs imposed on the Indians must still be righted and the wildlife encouraged to return. The frontier country of the Upper Great Lakes will never be the same, but the legacy of the first Americans, the traders and the boatmen, will never be forgotten. <laughs>